Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jumbo. Yes. Everybody have a good time in uh, Tanzania and uh, Dar es Salaam. Wasn't that a, a cool town? Well, some of us went up to Bagamayo to visit the historic uh, town up the coast. Uh, and then we got to, for, after lunch, we got to dance with snakes. A 10-foot python, a uh, black uh, mamba snake, and a cobra. Well, we didn't bring them back to the ship. I'll, I'll, I'll let them go on the plane when I'm on my way home. But now we're going to Madagascar, where we get to dance where, with our little furry friends. And uh, this, this cruise is actually uh, quite remarkable, because we're getting such a broad view of this part of the world. Uh, uh, and the more we go and the more places we see, uh, maybe the more curious it gets, of which Madagascar is probably the most curious. The great island it is, the fourth largest island in the world, with its own um, flora and fauna that are found only in Madagascar. So I'm going to give you a view of a lot of things we probably will not uh, have time to see, uh, but we are going to the little island of uh, Nosy Bay, which is up on the northwest coast, and a particularly uh, beautiful island and water around there. And then there's this vast uh, island continent. Well, there's the first of all, the great continent of Africa, where we, are, we touched a couple of times, and now we are sailing right to the tip of Madagascar and then around to Mozambique and South Africa. But you can see the size of Madagascar just compared, it's as large as any European country. But it is an island that, uh, uh, in the separation of the continents, was left behind, it broke off from Africa. Uh, India left it, and so it's a world to itself. Uh, it has over 5,000 miles of coastland, and then mountains going up over 3,500 meters. So uh, it has a... Uh, the quality of being able to go from the, uh, the coral reef seas up into a desert and then up into rainforest. And there's a lot of back country that's very rough and not developed, so it's very difficult to get around the island uh, over it in the mountains. Well, this is where we'll be going at the uh, Nozi Bay and the beautiful town of Helville. And from there, there are roads along the coast, but you see these massif, Marjorjete massif, other mountains that are all in the center spine of Madagascar. Uh, we will not be able to go see the vastness of it. Now, that is the capital up in the very tip of the highlands, uh, Antananarivo, which is uh, Malagasy. Now, the, the country itself, we know it as Madagascar, but that's actually a, a name that was never used in um, Madagascar. They call it uh, uh, Malagasy, which is actually a uh, Malay term from the original inhabitants of the island. Down on the south side, there's a great uh, coral reef, the fourth largest reef system in the world uh, after others around the tropical seas. But again, highlands and then points uh, all the way down to the tip of, of the island. The original populace for this island were Polynesians and Malay who sailed all the way across from Southeast Asia, about 300 AD is the estimated time when they reached there, and mostly from Sunda and Java and other islands going out as the spreading of the, let's say I call it the catamaran culture. And then they were matched by other people coming over from the African mainland, uh, Indians, and now they have a very mixed population. But the first uh, settlers there uh, came on these very uh, nimble boats. We've been seeing them out on the coast of Zanzibar and even yesterday in Dar es Salaam. Uh, but th this is what I call the original Hobie cat. And I have a couple of sailors who know how it is to hang on. And you can see how fast those boats were zipping along with an outrigger and this sort of claw tooth sail that's very handy to, to put up and take down. And so they came settling on the east coast of uh, Madagascar when it was a virgin land, heavily forested. They set up villages that are very similar to ones that are uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia, and then out into the, the Pacific. And so uh, this island is not really uh, originally similar to Africa. It was its own world. And particularly, it had some megafauna that are now extinct. This is the elephant bird, which is uh, the gigantic ostrich, I suppose. And they, uh, the records of it have been confirmed that uh, by skeletal um, remains of these giant birds. And they also had much larger uh, lemurs and things like that, but uh, now they've all been 
hunted out like the dodo bird. And so the uh, Malagasy people, who are now a blend, again, of uh, Bantu Africans and um, Indians and then some European blood, are uh, a, a very deeply indigenous people on this island with many different uh, groups and variations in their general language, which they call Malagasy. But, uh, but they brought with them skills. For instance, this is an iron smelting operation up in the highlands previously. There is considerable mining resources and minery, uh, mines in the islands now for um, some iron, some bauxite, and some uh, rare earth. But this is an illustration of all the different linguistic and ethnic groups. Over the long history, they were often a small, er small population in isolated areas, and then they uh, developed into smaller, or rather larger villages, and then uh, had, the, let's say, warfare between the different groups. At one point, the Marinda people in the Central Highlands organized the strongest forces and conquered most of the rest of them and made a unified uh, uh, kingdom. This was the, the, the uh, ruler of the Marinda kingdom that uh, unified the nation first. It's, uh, his name we can all say, or Adrian Ampohonima Marinda. And at this time, there were also Europeans coming to incursion into the islands because the um, as the Portuguese particularly came first, they, at 1502, first described the island. At that time, the capital was up in the highlands. This is Ambu Himamanga, which is the f traditional uh, fortress of the king of the Marinda people. Uh, that later became the capital, which is uh, up in the highlands to this day. This is the first European notice of the islands, uh, including the ones off to the right, which are now uh, Reunion and um, uh, Mauritius, which are still French uh, departements. But uh, most of the trade coming around Africa would go up through the Mozambique Channel and would incite this great long island that uh, was very wild. And a lot of the trade was back and forth across the sea, just like we're crossing now in these uh, uh, catamarans. By the way, that's a set in of Mombasa Island, and then that's the coast of Tanzania. But uh, there were no European settlements on Madagascar. They were all on the other side, on the African coast, originally the Portuguese forts, and finally the German and the British empires. Uh, but out at sea, it was always dangerous, because Madagascar was always famous for having pirates who would then prey upon the, the Arabic and then the European ships. So there were battles up and down this uh, coast between the local people in their swift boats and then the frigates with their cannon. But uh, in the uh, early 1700s, the Indian piracy, Indian Ocean piracy, had a, a base in the east coast of Madagascar, uh, Ile Saint-Marie, where it became uh, what they call Libertalia, uh, which was where the pirates could all gather, build a town. They were uh, a few thousand of them at a time, and this is a you know, romantic uh, description of uh, Captain Kidd and, and uh, Jane Aubrey and the other uh, European pirates, a lot of French ones too, would then gather, and then they would uh, have an organized uh, resale of their goods. Now, Captain Kidd particularly was famous because he attacked a, an Indian Mughal emperor's ship going off to uh, Arabia laden with gold, and that uh, led to his final demise because the Royal Navy hunted him down and finally caught him and took him back to England for justice. But uh, meanwhile, they had a good time there on the island. Here's a, uh, a pirate who's on, uh, I guess, his uh, rest and re recreation. Uh, they, they spent all their gold and jewels on uh, their Malagasy girlfriends. And why, why save any money when you're a pirate? I mean, what's, what else should you do? Well, wine, women, and song. There's... Uh, they already had taken a cruise. Well, anyway, this is the uh, Ile Saint-Marie, which is on the east side. We're not getting near there, but this was the, 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 the place where they had their town. And uh, it, uh, you can see that pirate island on this uh, cartoon-like uh, map, but that was an island which is a big limestone uprise covered with jungle, uh, but at low tide it has caves, and you can go in and then climb up, and that's where they hid their loot. And this is... Uh, uh, recently been uh, excavated by a friend of mine, Barry Clifford, who's a uh, marine archaeologist, and he found Captain Kidd's ship up in the bay, but the local people won't even go onto Pirate I Island because it has uh, too many ghosts. 
here is a piece of, of Bolivian silver that had been taken off a ship and was found in Captain Kidd's wreck just recently. And then this is the only uh, cemetery dedicated to pirates, which again is in the island of uh, Samari. And so that's what every honest pirate wants is a nice Christian burial, I guess. So you can go there today and see the, uh, the evidence of this particular um, colony of pirates. Well, then more people kept coming, and particularly tr the trade developed uh, between uh, the larger ocean. And the French came and established the first fortress of uh, Fort Dauphin on the south coast of uh, Madagascar. And then in 1895, under the Berlin Conference, it was finally agreed that France would have Madagascar as a, as a protectorate, while Britain had Kenya and Germany had uh, uh, Tanzania or Tan Tanganyika at the time. And so th that brought in settlers, plantation owners, and again, slave trade. Uh, the, the, uh, there was slave capturing of other groups in Madagascar who were then sold to the Arabs. There were also uh, African Bantu slaves that came over to work on some of the plantations. And so this was not a, a very uh, kind time. And then it was all finally suppressed when uh, 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 legal slavery was abolished, but uh, it went on, let's say, uh, under the cover for, for many decades afterwards. Now, the, the, the ruling families of the Merinda ki uh, Kingdom, based in what is still the capital, uh, had resisted the Europeans, and then they finally, as a protectorate, they took on, let's say, this is Queen Ravanola's uh, gowns, probably bought in Paris, and so, but she was, uh, <clears throat> very traditional, and she did not want to convert to Christianity. And it was said that she sent out her army and tried to stomp out all of the missionary activity. They, they, they credit her with killing a million of her own people. So they've called her the, the Lady Caligula of Madagascar at the time. And, but then uh, the, the uh, island was pacified with French uh, protectorate and troops, and it became a major um, commercial center for plantation. Sugarcane was the biggest crop back then, and then uh, other timbering, and then some mining. And so the, the Malagasy government took on European trappings. But there were constantly uh, re rebellions in different parts of the island, mainly because of the semi-slave conditions of the workers there. And so here's the Foreign Legion coming in to put down yet another uprising, and it went on for over a century on and off. They would bring in their colonial troops. These happened to be Senegalese troops. And so here you have uh, French leading African troops fighting other Africans, or at least uh, uh, Malagasy uh, guerrillas in the mountains. And this uh, is a, still a kind of a, a fresh memory among many of the Malagasy people because uh, the French really tried to suppress any uprising just like they did in the rest of their empire. But by the time World War II came around and uh, France was uh, not able to mobilize to take over or, or control all these large territories. They finally, in 1960, gave independence to uh, Madagascar. But for a long time, it was a département of France. And then they had, uh, let's say, difficult relations with a lot of the local people. This is actually a woman from where we're going, the Sakalava people which was its own kingdom prior to unification under the uh, Marinda kingdom. But you can see her, her flamboyant hairdo. And uh, these are the people we'll be running into ashore in Nosy Bay, even though we're not getting into the interior. So you can see there's sort of a blend of uh, uh, heritage. Uh, as I say, the Bantu African, Indonesian, Indian, with a little bit of French in there sometimes. But uh, there are about 22 million people in the whole country now. And it has a high birth rate and high child mortality rate also, particularly in the under, undeveloped interiors with not much medical care. And it's a, not as poor as some parts of Africa, but it's not a very prosperous country either. But it is culturally very proud, and we'll be getting a taste of it. This is in the area where we're going. At, at certain festivals, the women paint their faces. This is a Sakalaba makeup. I think you can get this at the spa if you want. But they're charming and animated people. 
as we've seen already with others on our way. It's uh, very few Muslims in the country, though. It's mostly proto-Christian in varieties, but they are also very animist, and they practice, uh, let's say, the traditional uh, uh, religions like boxing. No. Um, but they're a nominally Christian state, but not, not very. Here's some of the spicy food. This is actually a combination of uh, zebu beef along with fish. So we'll get a taste of that, I hope, on the beach. One of their famous traditions is called the famadihana, which is the turning of the bones out of the family tombs where they will uh, wrap the deceased, uh, perfume the body, and then leave it for a year. And then they will come out and they will carry it around in a parade, and then they will rewrap it and then put it back. And now this is a, a famous um, custom in, in uh, particularly the highlands of Madagascar. It, it, it comes from some ancient uh, uh, Indonesian and Pacific rituals like that. And uh, so the belief system is often a, a, a blend of different uh, animism, some blessings of the church perhaps, but they're also famous for their uh, funereal carvings, which are near the stone tombs that they put their people, and then they will uh, dance around. They have more. It's a, there's a point of uh, uh, pause and meditation for people to hear the voices of their ancestors, and then they believe that the, even the statue representation of them have a certain amount of life. A lot of these have been taken away, though, and put in museums in Europe and other places. So this animist tradition goes on, but the the building of these to totems does not happen. And famously, some of them are a little more, um, let's say, alive than others. But I'll move on from here. And there, some of the tombs have beautiful paintings. Again, a lot of them are very an animated. I don't know what the lady on the, the right is uh, looking at. I think she's part lemur. But um, some of these are now sealed up, and they don't let people go in because, again, like this kind of organic paint quickly deteriorates if it's exposed. Now here's an example of the, Mal uh, the Malagasy writing, which was a blend of Arabic and Sinhalese. And so the, these, this literature doesn't go back more than about a thousand years, but they do have their own writing language. And now they learn French primarily as their second language. And so just here's a little view of the crafts. These are raffia. Uh, grass, woven, dyed, bags, some beautiful embroideries. We'll see this on the island when we're there. Uh, even raffia chameleons, if you don't want to get the real thing. And a, a busy press. Again, you can see this is mostly in, uh, written in uh, French. So it's part of the Francophone world. Here's the capital of, uh, uh, it's generally called Tana. Ana Tana Coribo is the full name. Uh, but it's very steep on the mountains, and there were seven hills, like Rome, where the kings would defend and hold their capital to this day. This is the, um, the former palace of the royalty who have now um, resigned when it became a republic, and it's still the seat of government. Here we are, the Republica of Madagascari. But uh, it's a big place, and they've had their own problems because it's so uh, vast and so many different peoples, and it's uh, in different isolated places. They've had a hard time keeping a, the central government stable after their independence in 1960. Here's President City Nana. And this j young mayor of the capital city, Andri Rajiolina, um, protested the corruption of the military that had a coup d'etat. There was an assassination, but now he has sort of like a Nelson Mandela. He was in jail for a long time. Now he's out, and he's the current president having won the last election. Well, enough politics, but I'll show you just more of the land because this is places we're not going to get to see. This is a cape down on the southwest uh, coast, and you see the, the uh, broad beaches that suddenly rise to the mountains. And so this is what uh, Nosy Bay will look like, another... Uh, uh, palm fridge and hopefully a sea breezed beach for us. Um, and there's about three, four little islands right where we are going and if we had more time we could go out and visit more of them but this is, a, it looks a lot, quite a bit like the Seychelles and there are other delicious places we've been visiting. And so that's quite a different lifestyle from up in the mountains. So these are fishing people and um, 
Now they have a number of small pensions. You know, there are no major resorts in Ma anywhere in Madagascar. Uh, what they have is some French expatriates who, who uh, set up their beach auberge and um, mingle in with the local population. But the, uh, there's actually very, very few tourists who make it all the way to Madagascar. It's just not on the way, except for us. And then there's a lot of diving. Again, they have one of this vast reef system on the south uh, west coast. And if you look at this image I found, isn't the, that's a sea fan, and it looks like it's speaking to the divers. You know? Well, and this is the one area where there are whales. Now, someone asked me if they thought they saw whales up by, off the Indian coast, which I, I've never seen, and I've never, I couldn't confirm that. But the, the southern right and humpback whales. Uh, breed and calve in the uh, southern Madagascar waters, and then they go to Antarctica in the austral summer to feed on all of the krill, but they don't go further up into the Indian Ocean. But this is a, a common sight in the, uh, uh, the, the uh, summertime, or rather the, the July, August, September. They, they go south at now. We will not be able to see them because they're already on their way to Antarctica. But the, the whole island is not that uh, developed, so there's all kinds of isolated places and remain uh, some French Catholic churches in the villages and uh, a fairly simple and not out of touch with the world with modern communications. But Madagascar is really sort of a, a world unto itself and has a very lush uh, rainforest. So uh, about 90% of the forest cover has been cut and the lowlands converted to rice and other plantations. But one thing they do have are what they call the sacred trees. This is a ficus uh, and the banyans and other similar uh, spreading rooted trees. And I think we're going to go see one of them in uh, Nozi Bay. And they, call, they keep the big ones for places so people could go in and sit and have a private conversation. Uh, so here's one that's decorated with, again, zebo. Uh, uh, cattle horns, and so they will not cut these these sacred trees, even though a lot of the rest of the forest is now converted to this. And it's one of the problems with the wildlife is that the lowland forests are almost completely gone, and there are many preserves up in the highlands, but not in the broad uh, lowlands of either the east or the west coast. And they still practice uh, slash and burn agriculture, and they say about two percent of the land every year is burned over again. And this is a serious environmental project because they're turning par large parts of the lowlands from a tropical forest into grazing land, plantations, but then it goes to desert. So like much of the rest of the world, it's, uh, the humans are eating away at the, uh, at the land for their own benefit. Uh, there are natural deserts on the southwest coast. And this is a famous stretch of land that has some of the world's largest bo uh, boabab trees. And we saw a few in uh, Tanzania the other day. Uh, their, their trunks are incredibly large for very few leaves. And this is partly, a, it's almost like a cactus. It holds its moisture in its trunk. And the wood is not very useful. It's like a balsa wood. It's very light. Uh, but it, uh, it survives in very arid conditions. And there's a, there's a legend that this tree was actually invented by the, by the devil because he wanted to see the leaves, and so he turned the tree upside down, and so the, these top branches look more like roots than trees' leaves. But that one on the lower left, that's probably the fattest one uh, around. So there's a whole, uh, what they call the parade of uh, boababs in this area on the southwest coast, which is quite uh, uh, scenic but dry, and there are people who uh, graze and have agriculture in that area. The trees are not usually cut because they don't have any real value as timber. Then as you go up into the highlands, there are these escarpments that run up and down the north and south in the major center of the island. Again, a lot of them have been deforested. And the, the, we saw this yesterday. The making of charcoal is particularly destructive. And the, in Tanzania now, they put a tax on it to discourage people from just picking at the last trees and cutting them out. These are rosewood trees that are cut in the high, very high mountains and now floated down the rivers. And the uh, United Nations actually uh, uh, has complained to the government of Madagascar if they cannot control the deforestation, their whole land is going to end up looking like this. And already, 
the, the rivers are running very muddy from the upland uh, timbering industry, much of which is now going to China. And so it's a, a challenge to get up and over this part of the world and see what remains of the natural uh, world that the higher you get, the more there is of it. And of course, it gets cooler. It's not as uh, steamy up there. There's another area down in the Midwest coast called the uh, Tsingi, the Bemarka. Uh, and that's a, a, a limestone karst formation that has been eroded into what they call uh, a stone forest. There's one in southwest China just like this. And you can walk around. There's streams and some flat land in the middle of it, but it's almost completely impenetrable as a landscape, something like uh, you might find on Pluto. But uh, that's uh, a geological wonder that they've now connected bridges so you can go in the uh, walkway so you can go deep into it, into the stone forest. This is in the high central massif, which is the highest part of Madagascar. So uh, there's no snow-capped peaks, but there's Again, very curious uh, plant and animal life that I'll show you. But this is the octopus tree, which is sort of a, a spiny, like an ocotillo that you get in the, in the deserts of North America. And here, this is the protected area. So they're trying to save the remnant old growth forests, and particularly the, the last of the uh, um, natural area that, that is the the refuge of all of the wildlife, because so much of the lowland has been cut. Um, this is one of the reserves that they've taken out of the lowland, the Barenti uh, Reserve, where uh, they have a catalog of all these endemic species that are make Madagascar a, let's say, a zoologist's paradise. So here's, I'll just show you a bunch of them in case uh, you don't get them on your, on your finger when we're there. Here's the pig, pygmy leaf chameleon and the Parsons chameleon, which is quite large, up to almost a meter long. And again, they can change colors and look all the way around them. They have separate uh, orbits for their eyeballs, so they can keep a watch on us. And here's a sucker foot bat. You see its claws actually have a suction pad for holding on and climbing around. And here, oh, there we go. It, for those of you who like bugs, this is the world's largest cockroach, the hissing cockroach, which I, I'm sure we've ne we never have them on board, so don't bring one on. And uh, the harrier hawk. hawk. Uh, we saw one of the, uh, these uh, outside of Mombasa, pretty big, oh, meter and a half wingspan, and then a lot of smaller birds. Here's a, a kingfisher. Now, some of these are similar over in the African side, but some of them are only here in Madagascar. This is a smaller hawk, a, a kestrel. Here's the hupoi, which is a, um, a small bird that jumps around with this great mane that opens up uh, at times. And here's a nelikuri weaver. We saw some of these in um, Mombasa also at the park there. Uh, they, they move pretty quickly. It's very hard to get a picture of them, but they build nests, and we'll see them in South Africa. They're not uh, only in Madagascar. But this one is. This is the helmet vanga with quite a well, nose for something, sort of like a toucan. And here's looking at you with a Sukara silk moth. So there's lots and lots of these, and so they're the, the list goes on and on. I just want to show you the, the major ones. But this is our furry friend uh, of, of all fame now, because it's uh, the ring-tailed lemur are sort of the uh, uh, symbol for all of Madagascar and the wildlife. Uh, and uh, this is a, uh, an animal that uh, lives in a uh, group. And they, they don't, the, the tail is not prehensile. They use it for balance. But they jump in the trees. And they stay together, um, they mate together, and then they, uh, they have a scent that they will put on their tail and rub all the bushes to mark their territory, just like I do. Um, but they're very charming. We'll get to see a few in Nosy Bay. They have black lemurs up there. These ring tails are more in the south desert, so I don't know if we're going to see any of them. But uh, you can uh, uh, go, to, uh, go to the souvenir shop and buy a little stuffed toy for your... your, your uh, souvenir of them, but they are, uh, all these lemurs are unique to 
Madagascar. And actually, the name lemur comes from limoris in Latin, which meant that it was a spirit or a ghost, as in the Roman festival Lemuria. It was Linnaeus himself who called them that because they were so uh, spooky looking. And he didn't understand much about them, of course, but there was a sample brought uh, to Europe at the time. And, and they're mostly tree dwellers, so they can go up and eat fruit, eat insects. They're not carnivorous, though they are prey for other animals. Um, but they're endlessly entertaining. Now, this is in the morning when they get up and they stretch and then they do their yoga, just like on board here. And they warm up. They sleep together as a big ball in the cold night up, up in the tree, hanging on, I suppose. Uh, and then the, uh, the females uh, have estrus, and then they mate with all the males. And then the males take care of the, the babies. So it's a, it's a good deal. Oop. Well, yes, this is the, uh, again, the ringtails. And this is their range, again, down in the dry and southern uh, southwest of Madagascar. Then there are about 300 other species, big and small, and dinural, nocturnal. So they are, they probably were uh, like mice. There were probably uh, billions of them before they cut much of the forest. So now they're in isolated patches, and so it's a serious problem for their continuity as the humans have incurred on the habitat. But uh, here's the red belly lemur and what's called the uh, bakako, which is a larger one. And this one is like a sloth, though, a babakutio. Again, nocturnal, you don't see it. It's up uh, asleep in the day in the tree. Here's the black and white ruffed lemur, which is now thought to be extinct. And a red ruffed uh, lemur. Now, that's the kind of the fur style of it. And then there are quite a few very small ones. Here's the gray mouse lemur, which are only about the size of a mouse. And the larger gray lemur. Of course, some of these are, uh, photos are, are taken uh, in night because they don't come out in the day. Here's a, another mouse lemur. Here's the eye eye lemur. So th that's where they get their, their, their spooky name is because in the night you can see them if you have a light. They'll, you'll see the eyeballs around. And so this is, um, they're, they're often what they call, um, um, they share a territory so the different kinds will live in peace with each other because they're not carnivores. Uh, and they all have a very prehensile hands and, and feet. And so uh, they're very nimble, in, not just on the ground, but up in the trees. And um, rough hands from constantly climbing. And then a certain kind of teeth. You know, they have the, the uh, incisors for um, getting larger food, but the, the, that's called a dental comb, which is used for scraping and also for grooming their own fur. They have uh, glands that emit very pungent musk, and so this is how they identify each other and how they have their territory marked. As they say, they, they'll rub their tail on that and get the scent and send it around. They also have little claws here and there on their underbelly for getting an extra hold on a branch or a tree. And here's, here's one that is uh, on the, near the tail uh, for holding on because the tails don't actually hold very well. But this is their main predator called the fossa, which is sort of a small little panther. Um, and they also have a little civet, looks like a little wild cat. But they are the main um, predators along with uh, ring, uh, mongooses. So this is the ringtail mongoose. And they'll climb up the tree and grab them. Uh, here's one, uh, a kind of sort of a porcupine that lives on the ground, though, the, uh, the streaked uh, uh, tenrek, which will uh, run and catch them if they can on the ground and among its other uh, food sources. But this is the real predator. This is uh, poaching. And um, so, again, they, they're, they're on, many of them are on a complete critical endangered list, if not already extinct. And they are still out hunting them for bush meat and for uh, the fur. Now this is the sifaka, uh, which is a, a kind of a lemur, but um, it is um, uh, noted for its ability to jump. And they, uh, like some monkeys, they can f almost fly in the air. And there's a 
number of varieties of them. They look like a lemur, but they're classified with this local name, the sifaka. And uh, the, there's, there's one looking at you. Okay, we're going to have a blinking contest now. You win. Well, here's the, here's the, the, the delight of these animals, because they, they, they almost dance just for the fun of it. So I'm going to give you uh, one example here. Now, this is just because he's happy to see us, I assure you. And um, now, check out the footwork, because this is what we're going to be doing late tonight at the, uh, in the Horizon Lounge. But uh, we may not see the, this particular variety, but I think we'll certainly see some perhaps tamed or domesticated uh, uh, lemurs, and so that's the joy of Madagascar. So uh, let's say let's keep on moving, and welcome to Madagascar. Thank